All right, and I will start on the screen share. I have, I just posted a whole lot of outlines in case people, um, uh, in case we have more time. Okay. All right, so this was the article. Uh, biodiversity, and it just explained all the different things that the nature does for us, which is a bit annoying to environmentalists since everything is about us, but still we're destroying ourselves, right? We're committing suicide. Um, but I hope, I hope you were, you know, kind of interested in this list of things that nature does that would cost an incredible amount of money if we tried to do all this stuff just through a technological solution. Um, so the environmental services, that's pretty obvious, except that the list just shows you how multifaceted it is and complex it is. And then the accumulative wisdom of nature, the genetic code, the DNA is also really important. And then the extinction rate. So um, I did last time we talked about the fact that these articles are old, right? They are old. This is 1990, it's 30 years ago. And the trouble is nothing's been done. And so I did want you to know that. People knew about this 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And um, it just can't go on, right? 30, 40, 50 years from now, something will have given big time. But you do need to know that rich and powerful people are capable of extreme denial and extreme uh, control of the capitalist system. And then that would, that would bring about some Marxist revolutions. You know, there's going to be a lot of talk about capitalism, right? Pro and con. And um, that's the second article we read today is about starts in on that. Um, oh, why do species matter is a different uh, different article. This The one article just gave us a lot of data about why biodiversity matters. So each of you, and then I asked you to go um, to your country, uh, find a brief article or statistics about biodiversity in your country and whether many species are dying and why, right? And then I gave an example. Indonesia <laughs> is losing a lot of forests. So I hope you all managed to find some of find that stuff. Um, so let me start with Ramisha. What did you get? Uh, Could you talk a little louder? Can you hear me, Professor Now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, in the article of biodiversity, uh, the author has mentioned that the uh, loss of biodiversity is also a big uh, environmental problem uh, as the ozone hole and the greenhouse effect. Uh, I think actually biodiversity is uh, really, really important to uh, humans for many reasons. Uh, I think biodiversity provides humans with uh, raw materials for consumption and the production. Also, uh, biodiversity supply uh, oxygen and clean air and water for the human uh, beings. And also, uh, I think it is really important to the uh, tourism field uh, also. And uh, I have found one article about the uh, biodiversity in Sri Lanka. Uh, I will read some uh, important information from that article, Professor. Uh, a 
according to the national red list 2012 uh, sri lanka counts uh, 253 land snail species 245 species of butterflies 240 birds and uh, 211 reptiles uh, and 478 evaluated uh, vertebrates and also uh, since sri lanka is an island nation there are many marine organisms such as uh, 208 species of hard coral and 756 uh, species of marine molluscus. Uh, in addition, more than uh, 1,300 species of marine fish have been reported in Sri Lankan waters. And uh, also, uh, according to that article, uh, the area covered by close canopy dense natural forest decline markedly from 44% uh, percentage to 26.6% percentage and 23.8% uh, percentage of the land area in 1983 and 1992 respectively and to 22.5% in 1999. As a result of various conservation measures, the rate of deforestation dropped to 20,000 hectare per year between 1994 and 1999. In the article, uh, it has mentioned some, uh, 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 some causes for that uh, deforestation and the biodiversity loss. Uh, they mentioned that habitat loss and over-exploitation of biological resources and pollution and human uh, wild, uh, wildlife conflicts and uh, increasing human population density. These all are the causes of the uh, loss of the biodiversity. Yeah, that's it, Professor. Good. Were you aware of this at all before? A little bit I knew, Professor, but I got so many information from that article. Good. I hope, you know, that from now on, you would be motivated, right? Every class, I'm going to send you out to do some research about your country. And also, the, your second paper is a research paper about some aspect of the environment in your country. So I'm just trying to give you time to do what I think is something you, you probably want to know about. Were you happy to actually find this out, Ramisha? Yes, Professor. Yes. Is there anything about the coral reefs? Are the coral reefs declining the way they are in other places? I think, Professor. Uh, yes, uh, I also found some information about that also. Uh, According to that uh, article, uh, in marine and coastal ecosystems, uh, coral mining for the lime industry has caused ex extensive damage to coral reefs. Uh, and also while other serious threats include convention of coastal habitats, destructive fishing practices, and pollution from ships and adverse impacts from land-based activities. Okay, good. So if any of you happen to live like on an island, like Ramisha, and you wanted to do your research on coral or fish, um, overfishing is a big problem. So, you know, whatever you want to do, um, and, and I look forward to reading it because <laughs> I make the students do stuff I want to find out about too, but also that they have, it's important to them. Um, okay, Nitu, what did you find out? Professor, could you give me a second, please? Sure. Can I, should I go to the next person and come back? Uh, yeah, Professor. Okay. That would be better. Okay, so Rossi, what do you have? Hi. Um, 
For me, I decided to do my second research paper on the Tonle Sap Lake. So I've decided to research about biodiversity in the Tonle Sap Lake. And I have found out that the Tonle, the Tonle Sap Lake is home to a variety of species of over 200 fish species and 70% of that fish is commercial relevance. However, in recent years, the fish population have decreased and the amount of species found there are also declining due to overpopulation and a loss of habitat and that alongside with climate change has affected a lot of families who live along the Tule Sap Lake and also high rates of deforestation has contributed to a large greenhouse gas emission which makes um, a lot of um, climate vul vulnerable countries like Cambodia suffer a lot because in Cambodia, especially um, the five provinces bordering the Tonle Sap Lake, they are, they are um, like a lot of their industries are climate sensitive um, sectors like agriculture, tourism, forestry, and fishery. So when a lot of the species in the Tunde Sap Lake decreases, that affects the amount of income that the people have and that affects the, their lifestyle in general. Okay, so this is just uh, one example of how developing countries are getting hit the hardest, right? Yes. Per person, they use the least resources, but they suffer the most. And so they suffer because of climate change, but then they suffer because their economy depends on the very things that are decreasing. Right, Rossi? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because in the US, we can, the reason our politicians can keep calling it a hoax is because it's not that immediate to us, right? We can still make a lot of money on iPhones and stuff and not notice. Um, and then there are things like, in order to get have an iPhone, there's certain minerals that f mining for those minerals cause, causes a lot of pollution, but that isn't something people see like with their eyeballs, you know? It's sort of hidden. And so that's why I think it's so important to do research. You have to go past what's in front of your eyes. Um, all right. Nitu, are you ready yet? Yes, Professor. Okay. So, uh, so Professor, yeah, I have found an article about uh, like the a survey of 2015 where uh, it has mentioned that like 31 species and uh, has already been extincted and 390 are endangered, uh, which includes like mammals, reptiles and amphibians, birds, then freshwater fish and butterflies. Then the um, report has also mentioned like uh, among uh, 31 species that are already extincted, uh, 11 are mammals, then uh, 19 are birds, and one is reptile, and no species from the other four groups like amphibians, freshwater, fish, and uh, crustacean, and butterfly. Then uh, like according to the Red List of Bangladesh 2015, uh, the extinct species species of uh, Bangladesh include the striped hyena, the benchang, and black buck, great wolf, and uh, Indian rhinosaurs, uh, nilagi, slot bear, and etc. Uh, like as many as uh, 50 species of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, the report uh, has also mentioned like uh, 138 mammalian species of uh, which 11 have come 
uh, regionally extinct, 17 are uh, critically endangered and 12 endangered and nine vulnerable in birds category. Uh, 566 species were evaluated of which 19 were regionally extinct and 39 were uh, categorized as threatened. Under the reptile group, 167 species were evaluated of which uh, 38 were categorized as threatened. Then um, in amphibians group, 49 were evaluated of which two species were found to be critically endangered, uh, three endangered and five vulnerable. Under the category of uh, freshwater fish, 253 species were assessed, of which like 64 were deemed to be under threat, among them nine critically endangered and uh, 30 endangered and uh, 25 are vulnerable. Like same condition goes with the like butterflies and other species as well. And then I read another uh article uh, which talks about like uh the effect and like what can it causes in recent future uh which included like our uh like the biggest uh biodiversity and, and Forest in, uh, in Bangladesh, like Shundurban, a modest project sea level was rising during this like century, expected to be 90 to 880 millimeter. Like, therefore, by 2050, uh, the sea level at Shundurbans like may rise by over 15.5 centimeter. Yeah, the and, sea level is a huge problem for Bangladesh, right? Uh, Yes. And yeah. So, if, so on this list, besides just species, right? There's mm -hmm. all this stuff about, you know, um, flood control, right? And drought prevention. All these other things are more holistic, right? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So, so it was species, and then it was. Um, the water water level rising. Anything uh, else that you found with Bangladesh? It's sort of like around these two topics. Okay, okay. Did you know about that before? Like on a surface level, yes, I know, but like the service and all, how many species have already extincted and endangered? No, not that in details. Yeah, okay. Well, if anybody from Bangladesh wants to do a paper on the water table, <laughs> that's really serious, right? The, the strength of the hurricanes and cyclones and how much land gets eroded or flooded each year and how much it's changed. So need to Another thing you could do is find out how recently have those species, you know, started to go extinct or get threatened, right? Because the article I read, I assigned was 30 years old. And so it'd be mm -hmm. curious to know, you know, what the situation was 30 years ago compared to now. So that that's something else to think about. Yeah, Professor, like fortunately I could find an article which was about like, five years ago, but the thing is, uh, when we try to find article and journal about our like native, uh, like our country, most of them are in native language. So, you know, it's get difficult to uh, get something for the class and do research on them. Oh, well, you could just be the translator, right? Uh, there's other students don't have to read it. You can do it in the native language, that's fine. Uh, Okay. As long as you can translate, you know. Um, uh, yes, yes. So that's a good point. I should have brought that up. Um, Jamie, what do you have? Jamie? Okay. Hello, Professor. Yes? 
Yes, prof Professor. Uh, I have read a article about Sundarbon. Is it okay? About what? Sundarbon. Mangrove forest. Sugar bone. That's okay. You could type it. I'm not. I'm not hearing what you're saying. Um, Professor, sorry to interrupt you. She means Sundarbon, which is Bangla, and English is mangrove forest, which is the biggest forest in Bangladesh. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, okay. Yes, Professor. <laughs> so what about it? Just a minute, Professor. <clears throat> yeah, I have read article. It's uh, published in 2018. Um, so uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Professor, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Keep going. Yeah. Actually, I'm using my phone. That's the problem. In Bangladesh, Sundarbon uh, Reserve Forest occupies approximately uh, 6,000 square kilometers. This is the 60% of uh, Sundarbon, the world's largest mangrove forest, with uh, remaining falling in West Bengal. Sundarbon is a UNESCO um, natural World Heritage Site, as well as a, a Ramsar Site in international importance. Uh, so the, diver, uh, the biodiversity of Sundarbon includes over 339 species of birds, 528 species of uh, plants, 35 species of reptiles, 278 varieties of fishes, and 42 species of mammals. Many of these species are unique and endangered, including the musk uh, fin food, the river uh, terrapin, and of course the royal Bengal tiger, of, of which 106 were counted in the latest official survey. So, Professor, when we were in school, we used to know that there is 400 royal Bengal tiger in uh, Sundarbon, but now uh, this is the last 2018 it was uh, it's only 106 so we can understand that the royal mango tiger is extending day by day okay um is that it is that what you found is that what you were looking for yeah okay were you aware that the tiger population is going down so fast yeah actually professor uh, uh yes we know that but uh, like people are not aware of this especially the government they are doing nothing they like sometimes they want to uh, dismiss the uh, mangrove forest to make uh, to make like they had a project uh, electricity project to sit there because the area is very big and um, okay all right um, did they sign the the uh, climate, the Paris Climate Accord, Bangladesh? Probably every country did, I think. Um, anyway, so you all could find out, you know, if your country signed the Climate Accord. I think every country did, except the U.S. stepped out of it when Trump got elected. Maybe there's a couple others, but um, then the question is, did they do anything other than just sign it? So, um, Sristi, what do you have? Yes, Professor. Uh, so, like Bangladesh is one of the biodiversity rich countries in the world, but while over exploitation, deforestation, habitat con conversion to agriculture, pollution, and 
invasive species are now the most important drivers of the biodiversity loss in Bangladesh. Uh, climate change is predicted to become more important in the future. So in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, IUCN Bangladesh first published the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species in Bangladesh. Uh, 15 years later, the list has been updated, uh, including two invertebrate groups, uh, crustaceans and butterflies. A total of 1,690 animal species belonging to the seven groups, mammals, birds, reptiles, uh, amphibians, freshwater fish, crustaceans, butterflies have been assessed over the last 30 months. Uh, during uh, the assessment process, um, oh, sorry, Professor, the last 30 months means the article was on 2016. So uh, yeah, that's why it was uh, including the 2016 16th statistics. So during the assessment process, 160 assessors in Bangladesh assessed 1,619 species and categorized 390 threatened species. species. 56 are critically in endangered, 181 are endangered, and 153 are vulnerable. And sadly, 31 species have been classified as regionally extinct. The species listed as critically endangered in Bangladesh are the Bengal tigers of Sundarban, as my previous classmates have mentioned, and then the clouded leopard, the Asian elephant, uh, the Asian black bear, etc. And then, uh, however, the study has also found that three uh, new wildlife mammals that no longer exist in Bangladesh are gray wolf, striped hyena, and sloth bear. And the species extinct extinction is, uh, I think like the species extinction is a natural process, but humans have expedited that process. And I think uh, what will be happen in thousands of years, like we are making it happen due to the um, deforestations and uh, like yeah, cutting trees and harming the environment. So I think it should be changed and uh, we need to see like bio biodiversity as our moral duty and our is respective of its role in nature. So I think um, I also found like as we process towards vision 2021, we expect that people's participation for biodiversity protection will increase like day by day. Okay, so um, when you're doing uh, reports, try to, um, rather than just reading them or giving this just straight off data, you do an analysis, like how recently has the, species gone extinct or how, how rapid is the process. Um, for example, it might have been uh, 30 years ago, there were X number of species that had been in Bangladesh that aren't there and then 20 years ago and then 10 years ago. And that's just a huge issue with um, climate change, right? Is that the process is getting faster and faster. And so it's that much more important to try and stop it. Um, Raihana, do you have something? Are you there? Maybe not. Uh, Anandita? Okay, so again, if, if you are there, you need to contact me on the chat because I have to just make sure everybody's there. Um, Mosa? Yes, Professor, I'm here. Good, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Professor, so according to that, sorry. According to that article, what you have sent us to read, so that found that so how biodiversity it has importance in our life and then how it is affected so i, I read it but um, what i have found in bangladesh recently so for example like bangladesh is very rich 
according to flora and fauna diversity, which are maintaining balance in ecosystem. And presently, uh, biodiversity is affecting due to, for example, like deforestation, forest exploitation, agriculture and industrial pollution, uh, irrigation and flood control development. So, and because of that, there are a lot of things are shifting and also including like shipping land use and over exploitation of biological resources. But, you know, Professor, like beforehand, like in order to, um, what for, or in order to uh, preserve in uh, bio biological diversity. So uh, in United Nations Conference on Environment and Development uh, at, uh, at the 1992 over uh, 150 nations and including Bangladesh, they signed a treaty to preserve the planet bio biological diversity. But you know, pro uh, Professor, if I look at the present situation, so there is no proper inventory of biological diversity for the country and the primary data um, to, uh, there is no, um, so that they have signed for TT and then also like there is a law, but there is no uh, implement, implementation of that. So that's why professor and then, I, you know, there are a lot of Bangladeshi students they have mentioned that, okay, they're they're, they're currently, I'm sorry, uh, in beforehand that we used to have a lot of species microorganisms so which has a lot of you know um, good size in our environment in our in, and it has you know uh, it, it good affect now human life because it speeds up our environment but uh, recently there are a lot of things are you know getting um, vanished disappear because of you know as I, as I mentioned, deforestation and then over pollution, exploration of nature, this kind of things. And for example, the biggest, you know, one of the biggest uh, forest in Bangladesh, which is in the world even, mangrove forest, which has contains a lot of microorganisms. And this in a study shows that a lot of, you know, at, uh, you know, including in the Royal Bengal tiger and then other species, microorganism and vertebrates, they are, you know, very sparsely, they are going, you know, disappear. And a lot of, you know, even, uh, for example, including butterflies, it, it is, it, it used to have a lot of, you know, variants, but even now, if we look at that recently, you can find very few of them. And also even uh, including a lot of other animals too. And also professor, you know, there's a law and even they have signs and they have, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, and at 1919, they have signed TT for um, uh, preserving the biological diversity, but even government is not uh, in, uh, helping to preserve that. Because I'm saying that because like mangrove forest, which has you know really importance in human life because it produces oxygen and it produces you know wood and a lot of things, even food, and a lot of it has a lot of you know economical impact as well for that people. But what government doing? So in combination of India, they're going to plan, you know, power plant project, which is called Rampan, Rampal power plant for electricity. They're going to produce electricity for two countries. But what is the point of that? Because they're going to destroy that entire, you know, forest and they're going to make that. So I don't know how much the government is, you know, even it has a lot of controversial things, but government is not going uh, in hour of that. They're going to make decision based on that. but. Uh, if we look on, uh, on the other hand, if we look on biodiversity and think about environmental impact and human life, and so it's really going to be bad effect because it's going to produce some kind of small, uh, some kind of you know impact. With it, it will have you know human life. For example, um, disability. A lot of things is going to happen because of impact of the power plant. So it really you know. And sad professor to you know recent studies which is who I, I i do i read a newspaper which is called independence newspaper very recently and it it shows how it had how is going to be impacting our human life and how it is going to affect the nature as well that's all professor thank you okay um another thing for here's another thing since we have a number of students from bangladesh if somebody from Bangladesh wants to pick a different country, like Nepal or um, Vietnam or something, 
just so we got we get a broader view. Otherwise, there's lots of different problems like air pollution, water pollution, um, the water, you know, rising water table. There's there's lots of different problems. So, uh, but the thing about species is that years ago people were worried about species extinction, but the main issue there isn't just the species extinction, it's the loss of a whole environmental ecosystem, right? And, um, and when you lose an ecosystem, you lose, um, you lose clean air and water, you lose flood control, drought prevention, pest control. So it's not just, you know, the number of species, it's the whole environment. Part of the reason they're extinct is because their environment is their habitat is going extinct. So habitat uh, destruction is also connected to environmental services. So the more that you, um, that you understand also that species, extinction is related to this accumulated wisdom to the dna right and um that's that's another thing i want you to understand because i don't know about you but in the u.s it would get to be something like the panda bears oh they're so cute we don't want to lose those let's put some of them in zoos or something <laughs> and it just has nothing to do with what's really going on right um, these other underlying issues are much more important. Um, okay, so let's go. Raitana, are you there, Raitana? No. All right, so the next article, let's see, I guess we still have time. The next article I wanted to, I had you read was about posterity, right? What has posterity done for me? Um, so I want to get reactions. And the issue here is that view of rationality, right? What does it mean to be rational? So what does Mr. Heilbrunner mean when he says, no argument based on reason will lead me to care for posterity, rational consideration would most likely lead to the opposite answer. <laughs> did that surprise you? I want you to tell me, did that surprise you when he started talking like that? Or what you have to remember, that's why I taught John Locke. That's why I taught Kant. That's why I taught utility, right? This weasel word, reason, is, is the cornerstone because not only is it a word, it's the way we use our heads, right? It refers to how we are thinking. Um, and all he can do is try to appeal that, you know, do you really want to be part of ending uh, the human race, right? Do you want to take responsibility for killing, uh, for destroying the human race? But that's different, right? Than supposedly being rational. So, okay, everybody, I want to ask each of you about what was your reaction when you started talking about the word rationality? Okay, Ramisha, what do you have? Honestly, Professor, uh, I don't have the idea about that. Well, when you read it, were you surprised? Were you surprised when he said it's not rational for me to care about anybody else? Okay, Nitu, what about you? Um, 
Professor, uh, actually that seemed quite interesting to me. Like, you know, uh, uh, to think about it, uh, we are doing it uh, like instinctively that uh, we have to protect the environment and other things for our future generation and uh, all those things. But uh, when like, you know, comes about like, why, why should we do that if they are not doing anything for, like for us in return? Like that perspective seemed quite interesting to me, although, you know, I, I didn't quite found what, like, what is the purpose of uh, like doing that we are uh, being considered about our future and all. So uh, while like studying the, all those things, I found a thing like uh, ethical egoism and uh, self-interest and all of those things. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much. Okay. Although, although I'm not clear about like ethical egoism uh, totally. Okay, but I mean, he's saying that rationally i shouldn't care about the future right yes i mean doesn't that seem odd because usually when you say rational you mean as opposed to emotional or and you know being impulsive or something like that and it seems on the surface like wow destroying the future of humanity would be because you want to act on impulse and what he's saying is, no, no, you can, if you act rationally, you don't care about the future. Didn't you find that kind of odd? Like, Professor, I don't know like how to say it, but I didn't find it odd. Like, you know, people have different kinds of thought and pers uh, perspectives towards, uh, like everything, I might interpret it in one way and, and other person can interpret it in, in other way, but that didn't seem odd to me. Yeah, I mean, but when you read about biodiversity and say, actually, we're destroying life on Earth. Oh, but it's rational not to pay any attention. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... Uh, that's why I actually, one major reason I went into philosophy is because of the notion of reason in the modern world. As a I mean, I was an environmentalist 55 years ago. That was kind of what drove me into it is that our whole educational system, the way we train people to think, what we call rationality, what we value as being rational is leading to the end of life on earth. And this is absolutely bizarre. Uh, but anyway, Jamie, what reaction did you have? I don't know, Professor. Okay, I, I mean, the thing I worry about is people in these developed countries have been brainwashed, right? Or they've been whitewashed. They've either been brainwashed and they actually think that way and they have no problem, or they've been whitewashed in the sense that they don't realize that Westerners thinking like this have really, excuse me, screwed them over, right? The reason why the water, the erosion and the water level in your country and the cyclones and the hurricanes is gonna wipe a lot of you out is because what Americans are being rational. <laughs> I don't, it just seems to me like you, you guys, you, you don't want to die in the name of Western rationality, do you? I don't know. I think you should think about you've been brainwashed and you've been whitewashed and you ought to just speak up, uh, say no. Anyway. Sristi, what do you think? Yes, Professor. Actually, it was very confusing to me when I read it. And I also ended up being really confused about it. So I think because, I don't know, but for the, like, for the environment purpose, I think 
it can be stupid but i think they because of the natural disasters that scared them too much they don't want to think about the environment and they think things like this will ha- will keep happening so we should not really keep attention uh, pay attention to this well do they say it's god's will or something like that yeah they also yeah okay yeah. well i mean again western westerners benefit from that right karl marx would say do you remember karl marx would say the dominant ideas are the ideas of the ruling class so in capitalism the dominant ideas are freedom rights individuality god gave us the land to give it value and i just developing countries should not be buying into that right they should say no no this is all just a bunch of westerners exploiting us and destroying us but you know if you notice that the your the bangladeshis are saying god's will or something that's right where the capitalists want you right wrapped right around their fingers so they can come and take you know exploit your natural resources, your human resources, right? Have factories that underpay your people or they have contracts with factories that are owned by Bangladeshis, but the Bangladeshis underpay their people. But that's because the people from developing countries have made deals with the owner that are in their interest. And so there is this this hierarchy, right? developed countries, the elite within the developing countries, and then the poor. And so the article we read last time said that the whole deep ecology and valuing nature for its own sake and preserving wilderness really benefited people in developing countries, and then the elite in the developed countries, and then the poor get pushed off the land, cheated, whatever. So this is the same thing, right? The view of rationality. It benefits the developed people in developed countries first, the elite in the developing countries, and then everybody else gets screwed over. Um, does that make sense to you, Sristi? Yes, Professor. Okay, so I want you guys have to start thinking really critically and say, no, no, I'm not buying into this. Um, I, also, other, uh, I yeah. think the fact that yeah, the in Bangladesh, like people tend to put religion in everything, and they also believe like very blindly what other people say about religion. So if they are tend to take, uh, if they think uh, very rationally about something, so and the then the religion starts to um like the misconception of religion it starts to in misinterpret them and i i don't know like what happened and everything changes and they become the same again and the cycle goes on and on yeah well that's why i did have you reading those religions right because there's the basic foundation of the religions is perfectly consistent with not being greedy and not being arrogant and protecting the creation right shrisi It's yeah. just, and so what you need to think about is how do the religions get corrupted and co-opted into the culture? How does human reasoning, how do the human reasoning capacities get corrupted and co-opted into the culture? How do, po- excuse me, political leaders, but you can't just blame the political leaders because in a lot of ways they don't have any choice it's the the corporations with all the money that will advertise we are working with your politicians to build a fa- factory that will give bangladeshis 500 jobs and you know don't look at the fine print that it will lower the water table it will pollute the air it will pollute the water it will underpay but don't look at that and so the politician can't say no right because the corporation your government said no we're getting out of here and then the people you know just go how can you be so corrupt 
So in some ways, the governments are really stuck because if they say yes, well, yeah, then, the, you know, this stuff just keeps going on. The environment uh, falls apart and call it God's will. Uh, so if they say yes, the environment suffers and people eventually suffer. If they say no, people suffer right away and then they vote them out for sure. Then they're really in trouble. Um, so I, I do, I mean, perhaps your government is totally corrupt in every way, but I do feel a little bit sorry <laughs> for how relatively powerless the governments are in relation to the corporations. Um, anyway, so we can go on. Rayana, did you have a comment about the view of rationality? Okay. Professor, so, I'm not understanding your question. What was that? The view of rationality that he's presenting. Was it a problem? Yeah, Professor, I could, I could find the problem. So as you already mentioned, for example, if, if I related the, this article to Bangladesh, I think it's not going to work because if someone is going to think rationally and then it's really going to impact on religion and that, that person should be, you know, uh, how to express that's like, uh, should be, uh, it, it should be in trouble because rationality is something like we believe and I believe something like after you know reading that article, I found that uh, rationality is something like you know self involuntary theory. I feel, for example, if I like something, I I'm gonna do that. It's, it's being you know self interest something, right? So so according to that, in Bangladesh, we are not supposed to do that because if something happens, something like that, on based on our self interest, and who is is going to uh, even for example, like okay, let me give you an example, Professor. Uh, in Bangladesh, like uh, no, sorry, so in, in, in India, there is new law, for example, like uh, a, girl, a boy and girl can marry, you know, from their self interest, they can marry a girl and a boy can marry boy. This is the new act in India, but in Bangladesh, from their own self interest, if they're going to do that, this person should be, you know, killed even. So it's not going to work even in terms of environment, environment as well, Professor. So that's why I'm quite confused, like how it's going to work even if we, if we view in terms, you know, in the world as well, because it really has impact. What do you think, Professor? Is this going to work in the entire world? Rationality? Yes. Well, I mean, I think we have to replace reason with wisdom, right? <laughs> yes. Right. Yes, probably. Right. That's that's how I got into this business. Wisdom <laughs> is very different than reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So actually, I'm gonna I'll go back to the stuff that we've read earlier in the class because really the stuff we read earlier is all sort of building up to this and to where we are now and then how we think about it. And the way the Westerners think about it and the way people in developing countries are brainwashed and whitewashed. And I want you to understand that. Do you know the difference between brainwashed and whitewashed? Brainwashed, I'm defining as you actually think that way, right? And whitewashed is that it's whitewashed so you don't think, right? Just, just go along with the program. You know, you're distracted, basically. Um, so you either buy into it or you're distracted by advertising and social media and entertainment and you name it, right? Um, pleasant. It's pleasant and it makes you happy to be distracted. Um, so Raihana, are you there? I, I need to know if if you're if <laughs> there's some gray matter moving in your head and you can't communicate with me. I know that Anindita has let me know in the chat, but yeah, I mean, I have to call you X and if you never respond. So um, Rossi, what do you have? Um, 
in terms of I actually have something in terms of posterity in Cambodia like a lot of the people in Cambodia doesn't care about posterity if you talk to them about preserving the environment so that they can help future generations they'll ask you back why do you even care you only live for the next 60 or 70 years so there's no point to preserve the environment just live life to like as much as you like it you know if you want to use body oh body vitamin lotion use it if you want to use the ac use it if you want to drive the car anywhere just do whatever you like because you only have one life to enjoy and that hurts me the most because st uh, as an environmental uh, enthusiast it it's heartbreaking when my own people doesn't even care about the environment yet they complain daily that biodiversity is decreasing they doesn't have a proper form of income and then i just hope that they listen to other environmentalists in the country and just take the time to ponder about their actions and at least change simple things in their life if they couldn't take away like the big things just at least for example turn off the light when they don't use it and just don't let the water run wastefully just do these simple things it goes a long way too so yeah well it's just a mindset right yeah i think In, so the thing about environment is if you ignore it then you deny it right because it's so closely connected to your body so if you just are always aware so everything you do you're aware that you could pollute more or less then that's just part of how you think and so when you read articles or find out about stuff you're always on the side of preserving right but yeah. If you get up in the morning and you like a hot shower and you sit in a hot shower for half an hour and you, you know, you like soda pop and you drink 10 plastic bottles of soda pop without thinking about it, if your habits get, you know, entrenched, you're going to deny, right? You're going to either deny it or you're going to say, oh, Bill Gates will fix it. The engineers will fix it, right? You see what I mean? There's just yes. a really close connection. And so I want to go back to utilitarianism, right? Pleasure and pain and happiness. I mean, yeah, there is a close connection between your sensuality and what makes you happy and how you think. But that doesn't mean, you know, that you can think anything you, you like. And that doesn't mean I can do what I like as long as I don't hurt anybody else. And taking a half an hour shower doesn't hurt anybody else. And drinking 10 bottles of plastic pop doesn't hurt anybody else. That's the thing. When those theories were formulated, nobody thought it did harm anybody else. And now we all know it harms everybody. Like we're destroying life on earth. And people have such corrupted ideas of pleasure pain and happiness and it gets so embedded in their nervous systems that they cannot rethink because it would require them to change their body chemistry as well as their behavior you know does that make sense rossi yes the cover. i mean it makes me so sad because when I first learned about environmentalism, Cambodians, I'm sure we're not like that because none of that stuff was around. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, it just, it makes me grieve because I've liter literally watched this happen in my lifetime, you know? I've watched the whole world go the other direction and I've watched my country export you know, the worst export my country, the worst thing my country exported was this set of ideas about, uh, about rights, about land rights and land usage and private property. That's, that was our worst export is a way of thinking. Um, 
rather than you know any particular thing. Uh, anyway, does that make sense to you, Rossi? Yes, Dr. Bike. Okay, so okay, so now we have some more people. Um, all right, Fahima and Khadija. Fahima, did you read either one of the articles? Are you there? No, nope, they both disappeared. <laughs> I think they live kind of close to each other in Afghanistan. And it's sort of like the Taliban flipped the switch off, the Taliban flipped the switch. Those, okay, there they are, okay. Um, so Khadija, is she gone again? Oh dear, I'm just gonna have to just let her come and stay, but okay. So what I wanna do at this point is go back over the materials of the class to get you to understand when you read articles like this, you need to think critically about this stuff. That's why I gave you all this, all that stuff early on. This guy teaches economics, right? Okay, what does the economic system say about being rational? Okay, remember John Locke? All human beings are by nature blank slates. They're by nature free uh, to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they see fit. And they're by nature equal. Everybody remember that. Therefore, everyone has the equal right to life, liberty, health, and possessions a right to execute the law of nature, a right to punish people who violate their rights according to reason, okay? Okay, so God gave humankind the earth for human comfort and support. Guess what? Yes, and it sounds like people in developing countries are buying into this as they watch their biosystems falling apart and wealthy people taking advantage and exploiting them. Everyone has a right to their body, a right to what he removes from nature and makes valuable through his labor, a right to the fruit of his labor. The industrious and rational person, remember those rational people? They have a right to the land a right to preserve and protect their property, a right to punish wrongdoers, anybody that takes my stuff or any government that taxes me, that's theft. You're stealing my money, my hard earned money from the fruit of my labor, from working up that land and being industrious and rational. And that's what God wants. I'm God's gift to the world. Okay, um, and this is the, the view of politics, but I'm not gonna go into that. Mostly I just wanted to go into economics. That's the economic system. Um, marriage, if you remember, is a contract between two free equal individuals. They have a right to access to each other's bodies. They consented to it. Uh, he thought divorce was all right, as long as children are economically self-sufficient. It's all about money, guys. It's rational to want to have children. It's in your self-interest because children are your property and you can, you can give them your, you can let them inherit your property. Um, the, the husband has a right to the fruit of his labor. The wife works. So if there's a divorce, the children need to take care of her because he doesn't have to give her anything because he worked for it. Uh, it's rational to have children. I don't know if I said this before, but one of my students told me that she hates laws about children's rights because children don't have any rights. My kids are my property and I can do with them what I want, right? I created them. I, as long as I pay for them, right? 
I feed them and clothe them. You can't tell me what to do. Um, so uh, let's see. When children grow up, they have to agree to the system or else they can't inherit property. It's all about money, right? And it's all about capitalist money. It's not about inheriting land. It's about exploiting land to, to give it monetary value. The society is a free association of free and equal adults. Okay, and now we have this problem. Is education a right? Do citizens pay taxes to provide for other people's education? You know, or is that theft? Government's taking my money. You pay for your own education. Is health care a right? You go get yourself a job. You go get yourself some land. You cut down the trees. You plant crops. You create money. And then you send your kids to whatever school you want. You go get the doctor you want. You build the house you want. It's not my business. I don't, I don't care, right? So to be rational is to calculate the most efficient means to your economic self-interest, which turns into how to get as rich as possible, exploiting land, water, air, exploiting the labor of other people, and that's rational. Um, everybody has a right to sign a contract, right? So I work for a coal, I own a coal company in England. Here's a contract. You work 18 hours a day in the coal mines, six days a week. You want it and you get paid, I don't know, buck an hour. All right, here's a contract. You're going to sign it. You're free and equal. You can sign it or not. You don't want to go get a different job. Then you go find the other guy. The other coal, the other coal mine owner is, is paying the same salary because they've been talking to each other and nobody's going to underbid anybody else. Well, supposedly that was illegal, but of course they did it anyway. All right. But so on the surface, this is a free and open society and everybody has a right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. Everything, if you're rational, you're good at cost benefit calculation and self-interest. Um, the best way to, Locke thought this is the best way to survive and thrive. If people are rational, there's no need for government intervention. What happens if they're irrational? Um, and so what happened was Locke did not want money because he knew greed was going to be a problem. But, um, Greed has become a problem, right? That's the Achilles heel of the system. So first of all, it led to huge inequality. And we do have huge inequality throughout the world based on a capitalist system right now. We have inequality in education, healthcare, um, the amount of wealth, and, and Americans are conflicted about it, right? The certain Americans just say, well, I want, you know, please give me basic opportunity so that I can get the credentials, right? Let me give me a low interest loan to go to college so that I can get the skills to get a job that pays enough money that I can provide education for my own children, right? But it's a, you know, people on top decide everything. So that was the, you have to remember this, that John Locke thought he was laying the foundation for a free and open Western society, for a non-authoritarian society, right? What's actually happened is a, a accumulation of wealth at the top. And those people control all the political uh, elections. And so the politicians work for the corporations. 
And so it's the rule of the rich. It's not a democracy, it's an oligarchy, the rule of the rich. And I'm afraid people in developing countries have bought into it, or they at least aren't outraged by it, which I think they should be outraged by it. Um, all right, let's see. I got to get, I wrote down the order in which I was going to present this. So, um, so we had that, that, that. Um, okay, four, five, okay. All right, so here's the next thing. I'm gonna do a couple of these and then I wanna get your reaction, guys. Um, I'll do a couple more of these. And then, what is this called? Um, oh, I had it all listed here. Yeah, here we go. Okay. This is about the millions and billions of dollars that corporations that get, get their money from fossil fuel companies have donated to politicians in and you know in the name of climate change denial groups, right? So the wealthy give money to all these climate change denial groups and they distribute it to all these political campaigns. All right, so that's, you don't have to read this, but if you wanna know what's really going on, the billionaire Charles Koch, he is a ruthless, wicked guy. I read two 350 page books about him and his, he is really heartless. Uh, it's hard to believe people can be that heartless, but as a matter of fact, they are. And so, so that's going on at one level. And then at the other level is um, 97 out of 100 climate experts agree that humans are causing global warming. And so, the economic system is absolutely at war with the truth, with scientific truth. So my last thought before the break is that originally, if you remember, all of this stuff was the enlightenment and we're gonna have science and we're gonna have social science and we're gonna improve human life and we're gonna have this wonderful middle-class life and we're gonna have free and open society and nobody's gonna be greedy and nobody, you know, there's not gonna be any hunger or greed or um, pride or every, everything is gonna be peachy keen. <laughs> and that is not what happened. So I want you to think about that and think about how the, the class, right? John Locke, Adam Smith, and I'll go through utilitarianism and Kant and the other ones, but just start thinking about how that view of rationality in Locke might have seemed really good, but this is where it actually is right now. It's with the fossil fuel billionaires controlling the world and driving it into the ground. All right. Um, I have 25 minutes after, and so I'll, uh, we'll go, we'll have a 10 minute break. And if you want to scribble, right, if you want to do your posts, that's what I would recommend that you certainly can take a break, but you can write your posts. You can basically get most of your homework done, uh, by the end of the class. And I will try to finish the class up a half an hour early, because then I know you don't have anything else to do. You can finish your post, you can post it, and you can move on. That's what I really want all of you to start doing so that this course doesn't become just a nightmare in the back of your minds of something that, that you have put off or whatever it is, but a lot of you have a lot of makeup work to do. 
Okay. Okay, so. Um, so the next section of the class, we're going to just talk more about that notion of rationality. So um, John Locke, calculating the most efficient means to your economic self-interest. At the time, especially in America, the idea was this is gonna create a middle class because people can come to America, right? Immigrants, it's the land of opportunity. And it's opportunity because everyone can tame the frontier. You can come, you can get 40 acres, uh, Homestead Act, you can get your piece of land, you can work it up, give it value. And that's how um, one way the American economy uh, grew to be what it is now. Of course, now the big, the big ticket items are uh, computer based. Um, so they were agricultural based, and then they were industrial based during the uh, automobile industry. Manufacturing was big. Then that went abroad to your countries. And now we have technologically based source of wealth, but the, so this is a Marxist analysis, right? But the ideas, the dominant ideas are the ideas of the economic ruling class. So the ideas of freedom, equality, human rights, especially property rights, uh, those are the ideas of the capitalist class, which has now become in the US, this, you know, huge fossil fuel uh, billionaires, fossil fuel based billionaires who are in this incredible war. There's a war between two camps of zillionaires, <laughs> okay? There's the Bill Gates's, Warren Buffett, Mackenzie Scott, you know, the philanthropists over here, the progressives over here, the ones that are trying to use engineering to create, uh, to make us carbon free by 20, what, 35 or something. And then there's the fossil fuel guys over here. And they are they are putting incredible amounts of money into every campaign at every level. So even a city council campaign in a small town in Washington state, the Koch brothers paid for someone to run who would agree to let uh, Chevron, the um, uh, Chevrolet, build, uh, um, ease up on its environmental protection laws so that Chevron could build a, a plant, right? An automobile plant and pollute the air and pollute the water and create erosion, whatever, whatever it takes. But they, they have a science of it, right? They have it every campaign, every position in every state, all the way down to city councils to promote their interests. And that's rational, right? Now, John Locke would not agree to this because it's obviously not middle class. Adam Smith would not agree to it, but those ideas carry on from one generation to the next. So just like, um, when you say that people say it's God's will, people in Bangladesh think it's God's will that the stuff is happening. Um, that's a corruption of Islam, right? So I did have you read Islam and environment and I had you read this. And I do think it's fair to religious traditions. The spirit of religious traditions is very compatible with sustainability, like the notion of arrogance, 
of human beings overstepping their bounds and pretending that they're God, that's the worst sin. That makes perfect sense to me. It's just that when you look at the news, it looks like all religion is against all science. Science says climate change is terrible. 97 out of 100 experts, right? And then politicians appeal to religion as a way for people not to pay attention to the science. Um, but that's not fair. So as each of you develops your own environmental ethic, you can decide, right? And you have to quote, you have to find the quotes that support either that you think your religion allows for destroying the environment or you think your religion absolutely does not allow for it and it's a corruption and a kind of ignorance and corruption of desires that leads people to to defer to religion as just a sort of uh, backup system, <laughs> a way to think I can live the way I'm living and not end up going to hell for it, <laughs> right? Um, so, so, um, so I do hope that you start handing in your papers because I'm not gonna not require them. <laughs> So you had the first paper was starting to develop your environmental ethic and looking at those ideas that I gave you at the beginning. And now if you haven't had it in your paper yet, you can take this article that the notion of rationality is actually leading us to the destruction of life on earth. And then go back and look at Locke and look at Mill and all this stuff. So whatever you do, on that paper, it needs to get done. And then the second paper is a not a long research paper, but starting some research related to some something of interest, most likely in your country. If you would like to do research about what the United Nations is doing, or if you have a specific NGO uh, like Brock, for example, if you're in Bangladesh, what is Brock doing about this, right? What are they doing about COVID? And how is that also bleeding over into what they're doing about climate change? How are those related? So if you wanted to do something other than just biodiversity in Bangladesh or water, or, there's just tons of possibilities, but I am gonna make you do that. And then I'm gonna make you write your final paper on your environmental ethic. And I gave you the percentage of the final grade in the syllabus for how much it counts. Um, let me show you the syllabus just to remind you. Um, it's way back at the beginning and I can post it again if you would like me to. Um, but here we go. So, and I, you know, I do want you to know that I have designed the class to try and deal with the learning outcomes. The learning outcomes are designed so that when you get this piece of paper at the end of the three years, it really will mean something. You really will have some skills. So, and you only can get these skills by doing it, by practicing, right? You can't read about how to lose weight. You actually have to stop eating and start exercising, right? You can't just read about, oh, what are the learning outcomes? It's, it's kind of like, how does the teacher actually figure out how to make you do this stuff so that you actually do end up, uh, you know, knowing stuff? Definitely, this is intercultural, right? This is the most intercultural international project the human race has ever taken on. Obviously, this has to do with lifelong learning because, you know, if you don't 
your whole life is going to be deeply affected by this. Um, okay, and so I will go back over. Remember Francis Bacon? Here we are at this view of being rational means destroying the life on earth and not caring, right? It doesn't matter to me. I'll be dead by then. My kids will be dead. Uh, you know, the trouble is really your grandkids will, you know, their lives will be cut short. You don't care. I, I, it boggles my mind. I, I don't get it at all. But um, Francis Bacon, that is not what he had in mind, that all of this would lead eventually to the destruction of life on Earth. There were people during the Enlightenment who actually knew that eventually population would have to be controlled so that the resources would not get depleted. They knew that. But they figured everybody would just follow the science because they would they knew what a great benefit science was and how much it actually worked. And everything science did turned out successful because facts, if you have facts and knowledge, you can actually do stuff that actually works. And so people would believe science or they would accept the science and do whatever the scientists said in terms of population control, state sustainability. And they were wrong, right? They were wrong because they also thought the social sciences could mold people to be moderate. And they were just wrong about that. Um, John Locke's worldview, right? I said that. Then, do you remember Kant? So now, um, in response to the article by Heilbronner about what has posterity done for me, he has this cost-benefit view of rationality, but someone like Kant would say, um, well, we can re-engineer nature. That's okay, we can do anything to nature as long as we're trying to preserve human life on earth. We do want to preserve human life. The rest of it doesn't matter, except that if we want to preserve human life, we probably have to preserve some of these other lives. But again, how are you going to get from the desire to treat humanity as an end to something like, well, it's not only preserving certain species. Well, we got to preserve beef because we uh, cattle because we got to have our meat and we got to have our chickens and our turkeys. And but you know, there's not that many species we'd actually have to preserve in order to eat, and that's all that matters. It's just all that DNA information, all that other stuff, and all the ecosystems. You know, those those animals need an ecosystem and air so that we don't die from air pollution or water pollution we also have to have these systems and so but if you start out just with this view of kant and being willing to re-engineer anything just to save human life i don't think you're going to end up with all those subtle distinctions that were made in the article today um Okay, but Kant, you know, the moral law is only treat rational nature as an end in itself, never as a means only, right? <laughs> I don't see how you're going to get from there to, um, to any kind of reasonable idea of sustainability or preservation of the DNA. Um, preservation of the kind of stuff that the article today on biodiversity was uh, said was so important. Okay, I hope you understand that. Does that make sense to the rest of you? Somebody who thinks like an engineer is going to think engineering will save us and discredit all that other stuff. Does that make sense to people?
Yes, Dr. Beck. If you have to choose, right, which is getting more and more, we're getting more and more desperate. Um, all right, as long as that makes sense. And if you do have a question when I stop the share, you can answer it, you can, you know, ask your questions. Then utilitarianism, um, you must think about this, right? Pleasure, pain, and happiness. Um, and I'm gonna go back to, let me go to that article on uh, utilitarianism. Okay, you remember animal rights, obviously, Somebody who's into engineering is not going to care about animal rights. And somebody's into calculating the most efficient means to their economic interest. That is why we have factory farms, right? We don't care <laughs> about whether the animals feel pleasure or pain, or we don't care at all about their their experience of life and what we do to them everything is either treating rational nature as an end or calculating your own profit those two mindsets are very much opposed to the um, animal rights movement the idea of speciesism and the idea that Animals should have legal rights because of their capacity to suffer, right? To experience pleasure and pain. And um, all right, so I want you to keep this stuff in mind, right? Take notes, but your notes are not your post, right? In your post, I want you to react. I want you to reflect. I want you to get scared <laughs> to realize it's important that if, if the global culture is dominated either by the engineers or by the economic calculators, animals are going to get mistreated more and more and more because it's not, they do not care at all. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen to the animal rights movement. But if I were to bet, I would bet against it. I would bet that there's too many people who are too willing to go in the other direction and just use animals and not willing to become vegetarians also. Um, so we had that idea, remember? These are, this is important. The idea of maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain, uh, happiness, the idea that everything we do is connected to our bodies, right? Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Um, and it, it's just like animals, right? We're just like herd animals. But if we get trained well as adults, we're going to be able to be critical thinkers. All of a sudden, uh, uh, Socrates dissatisfied is more dignified than a pig satisfied. All of a sudden as adults, we're not gonna settle for anything less than the capacity to think critically, to listen to all sides of a question, to come up with a reasoned point of view because that will give us the most pleasure. <laughs> yeah, sure, Mr. Mill. Um, so good idea. You can even write your paper saying, this is what I really think. But now you should be understand, you should understand that, that Mr. Traub uh, is saying our pursuit of happiness is killing the planet. So now you have three different mindsets that are killing either all of life on earth or all but humans, right? the Kant, the utility, and the lock. All right. Then the next step was, oh, wait a sec. Where's Glenn Hedges? 
Uh, where'd he go? Um, okay, it must have been. Did I get it out of order? I sort of fiddled with this stuff, I know. Um, the misinterpretations of utility. What happened to that? I can post it again, but, um, oh, oh, actually that might've been a different class. Anyway, that's the main point is that utilitarianism is not stopping us from destroying um, all other life forms or even from obsessing about our own pleasure, pain and happiness and then thinking we're not harming other people. They can do whatever they like. It's a free country. <laughs> but yeah, everything we do does affect everybody else. At this point in time, it's a whole global phenomenon. Um, then we have Karl Marx, okay? It's all about money. Um, it's all about capitalist form of uh, an economic system. And then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after communism was shown not to work because when governments were given absolute power, they did not redistribute it, right? They kept it for their friends and family. And so there was even more of a centralization of power. Plus, they calculated the most efficient means to maintaining their power and privilege, right? And so they don't, they didn't show any concern for sustainability. Uh, they're just preserving themselves and their friends. Uh, I don't even think it would be preserving the human race at per se. It's just, okay, I'll care about the human race if it means my buddies uh, get saved, right? And usually it, it doesn't take seriously the broader implications of what's going on. So Marxism did not work. So then capitalism got to be the only game in town. And so it was given a lot of license. People trusted capitalism to self-regulate and it didn't. And the economic collapse of 2008 showed that it didn't even self-regulate in, in the banking system, much less the natural environmental system. Um, then I had you reading religious stuff. Can we turn to religion as a guide, right? Because reason, reason, none of these views of reason is going to lead to sustainability. Well, let's try religion. Is religion going to? Well, then there's all these debates. Um, and every religion has a fundamentalist branch that says, oh, it's, it's God's plan. It's God's will, especially if you're into uh, um, Christianity and Islam where there is an end times, right? Oh, it's the end times. I don't have to give up my lifestyle. So on the one hand, religion has a lot of good values that could lead to sustainability. On the other hand, it can get corrupted. So each of you can decide for yourself what you think there. Um, Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, and then we had that in theory, deep ecology says, we really have to respect the whole system, right? And that sounds great because that's totally different than what we've had before. And we have to set aside wilderness and wilderness protection programs and, um, you know, all these good things we've got to save the, the trees because they're our oxygen source. But we also have to respect nature just for its own sake. So we have to have these national parks. We have to, you know, wall off sections of nature. Well, then the argument against that 
that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. And developing countries, the elite in the developing countries don't, don't do anything, don't want to, or they can't do anything to stop it. Um, and then, so now we're at, you know, biodiversity is really important, but the economics professor is teaching rationality as in the discipline of economics and saying there's nothing in the view of rationality that's taught in every economics class in the world that would prevent us from destroying life on earth, or at least from destroying biodiversity for sure. Um, all right, so let me stop for a minute and ask, everybody needs to give some reaction. Boy, there's so few students here. I don't, again, I have no idea what's going on, but I do find it ironic since this, I cannot think of anything more important in the whole universe than this. And I can't get students interested, but you know, I've given up. I, I mean, I don't give up 50 years, 55 years and still counting. I'm not gonna give up, um, but need to. Do you have a reaction? Can you understand why I taught all this stuff in the past so that you could understand what's going on? Uh, yes, Professor, because you know everything is interconnected and right. And so that again, I don't know. I think a lot of your other classes are specialization, right? You start out and then you go more and more specialized. Whereas with my class, you start out big and you just keep getting bigger and bigger. So my classes try to train you for thinking about how everything's interconnected, but you can never get a job, <laughs> right? Because every job you get is more specialized. You have a skill and a, a knowledge, uh, bank of knowledge that tends to be pretty specialized. Does that make sense, Nitu? Or Srisi, is that, is that the case for you in your education? That the classes that are related to a job tend to be more narrowly focused? Uh, yes, yes, Professor. Okay. Like the whole purpose of education as we were always told when we were a child, like if you want to get a better job, you want to study this and this, you have to study science only, become a doctor or engineer, so yeah. Okay, so um, I hope you understand the value of liberal arts education. That's, that's another one of my soapboxes. I do think it's incredibly valuable because I mean, if you didn't take some classes that make you think outside of the box, um, would you ever be inclined to do it, Sristi? Yes, Professor. Actually, I, I also had this misconception like science is better. What am I going to do by learning arts and this? Like as I have always taught uh, previously, but after coming to UW and attending your class and other liberal arts classes, it's like uh, my views have changed a lot. And now I'm really looking forward to learn more. <laughs> That's nice. It's just, if you think about it, uh, people are going to start realizing how terrible climate change is, but they're not gonna have any idea of how we got there and what people are, in power are actually thinking. They're just going to be really lost. Does that make sense, Sristi? Yeah, yes, Professor. Okay, I just feel so bad. There was, you know, there were 17 students in the class and, you know, there's like eight of them that, you know, still hang on, but it's okay. It's just, I do think people are going to get scared because they're gonna realize this is real. And I just wish, well, anyway, I do hope my students who study it 
can it can at least have a level head and they can just say well you know an educated person knows what's going on right they know the historical context they know the intellectual history intellectual history behind it they have some idea of what people in charge are thinking and doing and so they're not surprised they're obviously worried because they they know that rich people are in such denial that this is ever going to come back to them and then either they don't think either they think they really can protect themselves from it because their money or they really don't care about their grandchildren either which is kind of i think they really think they can protect themselves and their grandchildren because they're usually pretty loyal to their family right because that's how they get to every you know that's their legacy my grandpa was a billionaire, you know, and they definitely want their grandkids around to tell everybody how wonderful their grandpa was. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, what if your grandkids aren't going to live past age 20 because of climate change? I mean, does that matter to you? I mean, what matters to you? I cannot figure it out that the Charles Koch has a has a mass a bachelor's degree from MIT in M engineering like he's not stupid but he just doesn't think holistically right he thinks in a very narrow specialized way it was not a liberal arts education anyway okay Rossi what would you like to say nothing much I just feel like it's really important that people understand the importance of liberal arts education and understand the importance of just opening up their mind to learn about environmental problems because we are living in a crisis and people need to realize that and do something about it because a lot of the times they are just naive or they just turn their back towards this problem and before they know it they will be in this trap and they can't even if by that time even if they want to do something about it or even if they want to change their behaviors i feel like it's too too late to make a difference even if like the whole population make a change earth will be in this in a phase that is no longer changeable okay um can you see how everything I've taught is sort of leading to, to things like this? Do you, giving you the tools to understand what's going on and why? Does that make sense to Rossi? Yes. Because I know to all the students, oh my gosh, is the recording on? Yeah, okay. How did I remember that? Did I forget to turn it off? <laughs> okay. So if you're listening to a YouTube and there's like 10 minutes of nothing, I hope you can fast forward, but okay. So um, I don't even, I forgot what I was, what I was saying, although I thought it was important at the time, but um, okay, Jamie, can you understand how everything I've been teaching is trying to be, has been directed at helping you figure out what's going on around you? Okay. Um, can you put something in the chat, Jamie, if you, if, you know, your mic doesn't work or something like that? Um, Anindita, can you put something in the chat? Because you said it's just your throat. Oh, okay. So Nitu had a power. Gosh, I mean, I have like three people who have power. Um, Okay, so Anindita, can you type something? She says she has a fever, which, you know, it's hard and, but you should be able to type something, that's all. Um, all right, so Raihana, do you have a comment?
Okay, so Nitu, do you have a com uh, another comment? Any other comments? Yes, Professor, I just got the electricity back. So I was talking about like uh, everything we uh, do in real life is uh, because we see the other people doing the same thing uh, or inherently. But uh, when we uh, attend, you know, undergraduate program or uh, like first to higher education, things like uh, things we are taught in universities and other levels, they uh, help us to learn why, why we are doing these things. They, you know, um, help us to justify and, uh, you know, make our actions reasonable. So that's what I think about the course overall. Yeah, it is the, the question why is the big question um, because it really liberates you from imitation and habit, right? Which is the way children learn. I don't know if yeah. you've been around a little kid recently, but I mean, it's so amazing. Like they'll fall down when they're two or three years old and they'll look at their mom to find out if they got hurt, you know? <laughs> I mean, everything is so much by imitation when they're really young, uh, it's scary, right? Because you know you're planting these seeds. I remember that because according to the world, you know, the way I look at my kid when they drop something on the floor, who cares? But according to my kid, you're, you're literally imprinting something in their brain, right? You're, you're creating history. And so, so um, kids learn by imitation and habit and somewhat by what they're told. But if their parents tell them to do something that the parents don't do, <laughs> they don't necessarily learn that. You know, they learn by what you're doing and also what you feel about what you're doing. Um, so if you turn off the shower, you know, after a few minutes, but it's clear that you don't like that, you don't really want to do it, your kid is not going to want to do it. And they probably aren't going to do it growing up. You have to just want to do it. So you really have to form your character. Um, so I, that's what I would suggest. If you don't want to lose your mind, right? And you don't want to write it off, or you don't want to get in this terrible syndrome of denial or dissipation, or depression or anything, the thing to do is to just program yourself to take pleasure in the fact that you're living a lower carbon footprint than you know you would need to be. And just try to encourage, like find friends who are doing that also. Um, I had some friends, I mean, you don't want to get caught in this thing where you're one-upping your friend, right? No, it's sort of like my friends and I are conscientious about this. We don't sit there and score points, right? Like when was the last time you had a uh, had a a can a can of pop or a plastic bottle with pop in it, right? You know, naughty, naughty. I mean, you don't have to do that. It's just a general conscientiousness. And just form your character. Just teach yourself how to live. And I guess from my point of view, um, I just, we knew this so long ago, and I just feel terrible that developing countries, you know, we literally exported our bad habits and our greed and our ignorance. And I especially think that during COVID, when the rest of the world saw that Americans embrace ignorance and their view of freedom is just literally destroying them, that the developing countries would, would you know, look again at what has been exported and mostly the ideas that, right, the theory of property, the theory of property rights, the theories of freedom, the ideas of happiness, the really hardcore uh, pleasure pain conditioning 
that corporations engage in, right? They hire psychologists who have studied this stuff, how to manipulate behavior, right? And then they pay them lots of money to manipulate people into taking pleasure in buying stuff they don't need, in buying stuff that destroys the earth. But we're not going to talk about that because if you bring it up, oh my God, there's going to be a little pain there and they might not buy it, you know? So, so I just, um, I just encourage you to, to teach yourself, re-teach yourself. But that's what I liked about college. I got to decide, right? What I want, like, who do I want to become? What sort of character do I want to have? And you can base, you know, reform your character now based on <laughs> wisdom, right? Rather than imitation and habit. And so the notion of wisdom, like Aristotelian wisdom, is totally different than reason, right? Um, so Aristotle's view of wisdom, again, the way it's taught does not emphasize sustainability, but the whole Greek culture and Aristotle's psychology is all about uh, ordering your mind to be to reflect the universe so that you're a microcosm in the macrocosm um, and keeping everything in perspective. I think that's a really important thing to do so that you don't get angry or depressed. Just keep everything in perspective. What do I have control over? What don't I have control over? And, and each of you has to find whatever it is you, you really enjoy doing that also helps other people. Like for me, I cared about environment, but I don't like science that much because it's too narrow, right? It's just, it gets so narrow. And I, and oh gosh, I used to, in science class, I always knew what the theory was behind an experiment. I knew what the principle was. I knew, you know, why the experiment was structured the way it was, but I could never make the dang thing turn out right. right? And then I just thought, well, why do I have to actually do it? Because I know the punchline. And of course, all that means is, is that you're not meant to be a scientist. You got to find something else to do, like philosophy. Right? So I just encourage all of you to keep going, find out what you like and do it but do it within the context of being a very aware person in terms of environmental issues, how we got to where we are, where we are and where we're going. And so I've taught you so far how we've gotten to where we are and the mentality. And I'm telling you that there are Westerners who are going to literally they're gonna argue that we should just let the developing countries go down the tubes in order to save posterity. That's the next article you read. Who really cares about posterity? Garrett Hardin says, I do. And that's why 4 billion people have to die and we better get them to die sooner rather than later. So make sure the Bangladesh goes underwater as quickly as possible. We gotta get rid of those people because I care about posterity. <laughs> so I do think you should know this and I don't think you should like go along with this, um, but it's up to you, you know, You're, you have your own mind. Um, so let's see, and I'm gonna let you go in a few minutes, but let me just give you a few more things that I had posted. Um, all right. Okay. And this is, again, these are, you could write your paper, your final paper or your first paper on some of this stuff too, if you want to. First of all, there's three examples of students who went off and found some information on their countries. 
So if any of you wants to read this, or if you'd like to study a country other than your country, since a number of you are from Bangladesh, but that's Myanmar. And then we have one for um, Nepal. Nepal is very interesting because they are more progressive. Look at that. I mean, this was a whole list of USAID climate change information. Um, Nepal was more progressive than some other countries. And then Bhutan, of course, is super progressive. If, if somebody wanted to do research on that, that country, that country is real, really ahead. Um, and then someone did Bangladesh. Those of you from Bangladesh might be interested in that two page um, document that the student found. Um, oh, so the last theme that I wanted to talk about was Lisa Newman wrote a book about stewardship and it's based on an Aristotelian idea of wisdom. And okay. So how do you emotionally, right? Hope, despair, and acceptance. Um, if everyone cut back on beef, the future would be brighter. If we don't cut back, and she wrote this book quite a long time ago too, but why don't we do it? Ignorance or no one else is doing it, right? Imitation, uh, the advantage to cheating, we benefit from other people's self-control. We can cheat without consequences. Um, the disadvantage to being self-controlled, again, you just do it because you're forming your character. You don't do it because, you know, of any short-term cost-benefit, anything like that. You just decide who you want to be. The fallacy of rational utilitarianism, right, Bentham? Um, and uh, so she talks about that. Uh, most McDonald's hamburgers are really bad, <laughs> right? They're cutting down the rainforest so that you can get your burgers for five cents less. Um, I had a house guest in my house for the last 10 days and she, I eat healthy, right? I don't eat the foods most people eat at all. Most people don't. Very few people eat the food that I eat. But I wasn't going to buy junky food. So, you know, there was uh, places to get food nearby. And I think what I can gather is that when I was off doing my exercise, she got fast food and she hid it. <laughs> Because after she left, there was this huge bag of just garbage. So the, the other thing about fast food is that it creates all this plastic and non-recyclable garbage. And so that was, I had to throw it away. And I've, like, I haven't eaten, I have never eaten much fast food ever. Um, but anyway, that was, that was interesting. Um, SUVs. So some of this stuff is really directed toward Americans, but you can, you know, page through it. We have a natural schizophrenia. People say, oh, well, I recycle, but oh my gosh, Americans just are 50 times more wasteful than my parents were. And my parents' generation didn't even think about that stuff. It's just that they, what it meant to live involved way, way less um, carbon footprint, um, simplicity. So thinking about what does it mean to live simply or deliberately? And what she means by reason, of course, is not at all what Locke means. So that's why I use the word wisdom rather than reason. Uh, the principle of, of simplicity, spiritual simplicity, cultural simplicity, economic simplicity. And I think you should, you would understand this by now, I think. Individualism, competition, um, 
corporate domination and exploitation. Um, and she is already talking about footprint. This was 30 years, at least 30 years ago. Spiritual simplicity, and we've talked about the Pope, right? Catholic Church. Um, and so you could add the other religions. Again, she uses Christianity because it's, um, it's, she's mostly oriented toward Americans, but I think one of the big themes is that it doesn't matter what country, this is a global, everything's global. Um, live an integrated life, live consciously, take pleasure in, in what you do. Um, let's see, political, okay. So that is quite a bit like the Pope, political simplicity, economic, um, all right, so that was that document for you to think about, uh, and you might want to quote from it, one of your papers, she, another part of her book just talks about specifics about technologies, um, natural capital that we're using, um, the so-called science of economics ignores the natural world. So we've studied that, right? The, the article by Heilbrunner, his view of rationality, what he taught economics. And supposedly that's a science, but it's not. It's just bogus. Um, it's just, a, it, it sort of is the academic co-opting by capitalism, right? Again, Karl Marx said the dominant ideas are the ideas of the wealthy class. So the dominant idea of economics is the idea that benefits capitalism, right? So it's called a science of economics. And I'll tell you why it's bogus. Because, and I have, you know, economics teachers I know them and they say that in the first chapter of the book, it gives you this model of human nature as a homo, you know, uh, a consuming, right? And a rational consumer calculates his most, his benefit, right? His self-interest. Um, but the thing is, nobody does that. So if you really look, at people's pocketbooks or people's habits, people will make incredible sacrifices so that their children can have a better world. And so the incredible irony here is that people do make sacrifices for their children, but those sacrifices do not include lowering their carbon footprint. They include, you know, saving money for college or they include buying something for your kid that you don't buy for yourself, or they include paying for your kid to be in the soccer team or the quiz bowl or all sorts of stuff and making that sacrifice. So I think parents who make those sacrifices for their children would be called irrational. <laughs> ah, and this is called science, are you kidding? It's so convoluted and it is so self-interested by the fossil fuel capitalists, right? Um, changing the mindset. She goes through the, we need a new industrial revolution. We've had one, we need a different one. Green automobiles, green houses, um, sustainable water, green waste, um, all of this stuff was known and there were books about it long, long time ago. But if you want to page through that to so just get an idea of all the different ways of thinking about it, how everything links together. Um, and then uh, another possible paper topic that you might want to look at and uh, is what I did when we left for COVID. So I had to hightail it back to the States and I almost got caught in Bangladesh. 
I got a flight through Singapore. And the day after I was in Singapore, the airport closed. So I, <laughs> I was just like hightailing it out. But after I got there, I wrote letters to the students in my classes and they could use Aristotle's uh, virtues as how is it that COVID is um, uh, forcing you to exercise these virtues at a higher level or in a different way? How can you learn from the experience? Now, this was and you know at the beginning of COVID. So this letter, you could look at it, but I also want you to think about it in terms of environmental issues beyond just COVID, right? So COVID might end, but we will have, you know, more climate change issues and more pandemics and things like that. So this was the letter I wrote. And then there's all these virtues, right? Courage, even temperedness, ambition, honor, sociability. These were, this was when the students were kind of frightened. They didn't know, you know what was gonna happen. Um, and now, of course, you're in a different kind of mood. So um, the, the administration was making decisions and people were complaining about those decisions, which people do, um, but I didn't have any opinions either way. I, I stay out of it because again, I'm just a, an adjunct teacher and I, I tend to trust administrators unless there's some reason not to because I would be so bad at those jobs. Um, but anyway, if you wanted to look at that and brainstorm that, and that might inspire you to write your first paper, or your last paper, or whatever. Um, but I will then post your assignment for um, what Wednesday, and I'm still not positive about what I'm going to make you read. Um, I think I might make you read two articles, and you don't have to go find something in your country. But if you know if you find that it's not that hard to dig up something about your country, um, I would do it. You know, um, just just for your own edification, just so you know stuff that I guess to me matters that you know it rather than be ignorant. Um, all right, so I will take questions. And I'll let you go in at least seven minutes. We have 37 minutes before the official class ends. And I definitely want you to sit, stay where you are and finish that post, okay? Uh, so I want, I want at least five of them to be right there by tomorrow or the next day when I get to read them. I haven't read, well, I've read them. I think I got caught up about a week ago and I have a list of how many were posted uh, as of a few hours ago. And it's just disappointing. There just aren't enough people catching up. There's just a lot of students that are way behind. Um, um, professor, um, can you, uh Tell us again about the extra credit posts. Well, if you wanted anything, like if you wanted to write that letter, okay? So, okay, possible extra credit. You could write this letter, you know? You could write a post that's responding to that extra credit, right? You could write, a uh, response to Newman's view of living simply, right? Simplicity. Um, you could write um, about vegetarianism, right? Why be a vegetarian? Um, and if you did that, I would want you to look up a little bit more, read a little bit more, but 
But the person goes through a bunch of arguments. Well, maybe you wouldn't have to. I mean, just read this outline and just respond to the arguments. They're, they're things you should probably think about. Um, we should stop eating meat, right? We're never going to be able to treat the animals decent, decently because it would cost too much money. Um, we have to eat less or just not eat meat. Um, okay, so you could do that if you want. Um, you Anything I've said today that sort of inspires you, like if you wanted to write about why being rational is completely irrational, <laughs> right? Why the science of economics is bogus and it's just a bunch of capitalists getting rich or why, you know, why the people in my country have gotten brainwashed and whitewashed, right? Or um, why, you know, I think Islam is consistent with environment. You can, I mean, they're posts, they're not that long. You can just crank them out, uh, something that you care about. And then it's, you have a total of 14. So whatever it is you write, I'm gonna divide it by 14. So if you do 14 regular ones and extra credit, your average score will be higher, your grade will go up. If you, do, if you don't do the regular posts, but you do extra credit instead, maybe you do eight of the regular posts and six extra credit. It's okay, I'll divide it by 14. Okay? Yes, Professor. That's Thank a good you. question. Yeah. So it's giving the, a chance for the students who are behind to start filling in the gaps with things that, you know, they're thinking about now. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I think I'll give you a couple, a couple of articles next time that says we got to let those developing countries die off. It's too bad. If you feel bad about it, go ahead, jump in the, jump off the lifeboat and kill yourself. <laughs> if I were you, I wouldn't be real happy about this. <laughs> okay, so I'll sit here and and answer other questions, but you're free to go. Thank you, Dr. Black. Goodbye. Sure. Get your homework done. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Bye-bye. So, Rihanna, I, Rihanna, I just haven't heard anything from you. And so I don't have any reason to think you were there. Um, okay, I just think I'm gonna end it. Oh, um, nope, um, cancel and stop.